All right, and welcome to another edition of Interviews with the Haunting Masters. We have a special live podcast tonight. Uh, got three of probably the best uh, mule deer hunters that I know of in the country right now um, sharing their knowledge with us this evening. And uh, we're going to be getting into some questions and taking questions from you guys that are out there in uh, Facebook land watching this and following along. Uh, so... We're going to get started by introducing you guys, and then we'll start off with, uh, well, I got Chad sitting next to me. Go ahead, Chad, introduce yourself. Chad Roberts. And, How uh, you guys doing? Why don't you give us a little quick rundown about yourself real quick? Uh, New Arizona. Killed a few deer here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple. Uh, enjoy the desert. That's uh, really my strong point. Yep. An occasional elk. Killed an antelope. Yeah, you're a pretty accomplished guy. <laughs> um, so if you don't know, if you've been living under a rock, Chad probably killed uh, one of the biggest deer ever in the desert here in Arizona. Uh, so we also got with us uh, Travis Nowatney. Travis, how you doing tonight? Oh, I'm, I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Good, man. Give us a little quick uh, rundown about yourself. Uh, just an Idaho native here. I live here in Caldwell. Um, just love to hunt, love to hunt mule deer, elk, bears, you know, anything that I can hunt. I like to get out and enjoy the mountains. So that's, a, that's about it. And a gist, I guess. <laughs> and then we got the, uh, the gray light hunter, Marlon Holden. How you doing? I'm doing great, John. Good evening. How are you? I'm great, man. Can't complain. Awesome. Just just got done chowing down on some uh, Flemings with Chad before we hit the uh, the old podcast. Got to fill the belly. So I hear that. <laughs> give us a quick rundown about yourself, just in case anybody out there that's watching this doesn't know who you are. Um, Southern California for now. Been here for like the last 20 years. It's uh, an interesting place to be based out of when you love hunting mule deer because you have to go everywhere to do it. But uh, it's been a good life. Uh, father to a beautiful six-year-old little boy. He's going to be six in June. And um, just uh, enjoying God's way out in nature. Awesome. Well, I'm going to actually start off with you. Um, first question that I had sent over to me earlier today was uh, was directed at you. What, what do you accredit uh, your consistent success to? Give me like three... I don't know, three rules to live by or three things that you do that uh, allow you to have the success that you have. John, that's, um, it's easy to answer in and of itself, but it's more the question that you really have to like look within on, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people look for the quick, easy five tips to success or the 10 steps to freedom or what's going to make me better at this or that and at the end of the day i mean you know because you're tenacious and you get it done too um it, it just comes down to work ethic it comes down to drive like you you can be half as skilled as the next guy but have 10 times more determination and get it done because you just have more grit mm -hmm. um i don't think i'm the greatest hunter in the world and i don't want to sure, have yeah. like any type of like big chip on my shoulder i mean travis and chad are better than i am i just you know i'm just like i have a an insane work ethic i'll like totally freaking work anybody under the table and and that's all i you know know that i can bring to the table so three things um i'm gonna say attitude i've, I've spoken about attitude and ability before you mm -hmm. have to have a great attitude and it has to be paired with some level of ability if you don't have one of those you're really not gonna have consistent success it's really going to be something that will be detrimental to you in the long run if you're lacking either one um, and then, you know, consistency really comes down to the level of persistence and tenacity that you have, because the fact is, is we're all going to fail on these hunts, right? You have oh, a yeah. bow in your hand, you're, you're kind of set up at a disadvantage right from the start from, from most people's perspective, like, oh gosh, I have a bow, you know, I'm going to take something down a free range animal with a bow. And, and realistically, I mean, I've told this to a lot of different people, but it's just like having a rifle in your hand. You have to get accustomed to knowing that that's the only option that you have in the moment that you decide in your head that you switch quit switching weapons and just decide hey i'm going to conquer bow hunting you're going to be better at hunting in every aspect whether it's rifle 
muzzle loader or a bow, you'll become really good once you decide to adopt a mentality of, you know, I'm, I'm only going to be a bow hunter. And that's not to say that there aren't great rifle hunters. This, this isn't a debate on bow or rifle. It just really comes down to the fact of when you decide to choose and rifle hunting no longer becomes hard, it becomes easy. And then bow hunting becomes easy as a result of you deciding that that's the only weapon you choose. So tenacity and knowing you're going to fail is the biggest attribute to your success with regard to the fact that you just don't quit. You fall, you get back up. You fall, you get back up. Mm-hmm. And every time you fall, it's a numbers game. You, the more you get back up and the more you stay with it, success will level in your odds. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I, I really, I really believe that, that those are, I would say in, in just the best three things I could come up with offhand right now. Awesome. You know what? I'm actually going to, I'm going to throw that same question at the book to you guys. Uh, go ahead, Travis. Why don't you, uh, give us what your, uh, what you attribute you your success to? Give me the three three things that you attribute your success to. Well, I think uh, I think Marlon hit it on the head a little bit there with you know just being not giving up and just going for it, going all in, and when things aren't thrown, you know the cards aren't dealt your way, just to get back up and go for it. So I think you know I think attitude, how you go about it. Um, just being tenacious, like you said, and you got to love it. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you're going to fail. So you got to be, you've got to love failure. You've got to love being out in God's country on the mountain, you know, hitting the desert, hitting the high country. You got to love it. I mean, it's all part of the game. So success is a small fraction of what hunting really is. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I tell people that all the time. I say, if you want to get into bow hunting, you got to you gotta love everything about it because if you're just in it to kill stuff, you're going to go home disappointed more, more often than not. You know, there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot of days where you go home or a lot of tags that don't get filled and um, you just got to be, you got to be there for the whole thing for the whole holistic part of of bow hunting, so. Well, I think that, uh, you know, I get asked a lot, we just make it seem like it's easy and uh, people don't see the failures and all the bumps in the road along the way. Uh, You know, John mentioned that big deer I killed a few years ago. You know, I I failed numerous times on him. You know, that was a, I, I tested myself on that one and just being persistent and not quitting. Uh, you know, I I just spent this last weekend, you know, I, I burnt 16, 17 miles up out there, just learning new country, learning the ins and outs, new stuff. So I could, you know, see the whys and the whats. And when I go back later and I have activity going on there, you know, I'll, I'll have a reason. And it, it just makes things that much easier yeah i'm gonna ch- I'll ch- chime in here real quick and just to kind of tee off on what chad said you know i i get the unique privilege and perspective of being next to his side a lot of times through some of the scouting and i'm not there half as much as he is um he lives there and he's been doing it you know he's the same age as i am dang there and 38 years old and and been doing it his entire life and i can attest to the fact the kind of cover country we cover when we're doing it is insane. I mean, hundreds of miles in a day. So when he says he's learning new country, it almost like makes my draw drop to the floor because, um, (laughs) you know, I mean, the type of intimacy that he has with the country, it's, he literally is in tune with the animals, like what they're doing, exactly what pattern they're in at that particular time. So when it's like go time, it's not even a thing for him. He, it's almost like they're his family members and he knows where they are and he just has to show up. I, I mean, but it's because of the fact that he's doing it right now where everybody else is just like hoping they get a tag or not really caring. And he's got that work ethic. And, and so does Travis. I mean, I can attest to that with Travis too. Yeah. Crazy. Every, every time I talk to Chad uh, or any of you guys, really, you're always doing something that's related to what you're going to be doing that season coming up. And I think that's the biggest thing with anybody who's really successful uh, in hunting 
is that they spend the time and they and they pay attention to the details and and really dissect what it is that they're trying to accomplish and and, and find whatever information they can it, whether through scouting or or whatever you know um to make it happen it's doing anything and everything possible to make it happen and uh you know my hat's off to the guys that can do that you know uh that that's all dedication you know and not uh not everybody unfortunately not everybody has the time too but you got to make it steal it you know borrow from peter to pay paul and steal it from whatever uh to get in there and actually well here, here here's the deal with time I, I i get the time question a lot I, you know I've, I've got a family and i i spend lots of time with them i go to the gym every day uh, I work just like everybody else does. What changes is I don't go to the bar. I don't watch football on Sundays. I don't go to my buddy's house for yeah. barbecue. Yep. You know, that's. Yep. I give up a lot of that you stuff. Figure too. out what you want and go for it. That's such a huge key point you just said there, Chad. Like, I, I know Travis and Chad, like the back of my hand, they are literally my brothers that I wasn't born from the same mother or father. I mean, they're brothers. I would literally freaking do whatever it took to drag them off the mountain. That's how much I have love for them. And it's interesting that all of us share that same kind of weird behavior. We don't care about what everybody else is doing what's going on. It's mm -hmm. the task at hand. Like, that's, not, that's something that I can, Chad hit the nail on the head with that one. Awesome. Well, I'm going to jump into a couple questions here. Um, one of the questions we got was, and I, and I get this often, and I ask this of a lot of guests, and I, I think it's always a good question. What are some of the things that you do to choose your hunting spot? Before you get boots on the ground, um, you know, give me a couple of, uh, give me a couple of things of what you're doing before you actually get out there and start scouting and then we'll actually get into when you're out there scouting. Actually, I want, I want Chad to get into the, the scouting part when we get to that part, because he's, he's unique. Like you were saying, he, he makes, he makes those deer, his family members and whatnot. So, um, so go ahead. One of you guys, Travis, you want to start off with, uh, what, you know, some of the things you do and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let Marlon pipe in right there. Sure. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of my, uh, I don't know, a lot of the stuff I look for is, um, you know, a lot of it comes down to just like a, a gut intuition. You know, I have these places that, you know, especially here in Idaho, I've been through, you know, most of the state and I have these places in the back of my head, you know, the places that I drive by or whatever I look and it just looks like good deer country to me. So um, I basically, I, I've got a list and I'll go through and I'll check these areas out. I'll check them for deer numbers, that kind of thing first. And if there's deer numbers there, then, you know, that's when I'll really start to put boots on the ground. You know, I'll, I'll look for, you know, a secluded sagebrush basin that's got some springs in it and a lot of bitter brush and that kind of thing that I know could hold, you know, an older age class buck. And, you know, then a lot of it just comes to boots on the ground. Um, a lot of the high country stuff, it's, you know, you kind of got to know a mule deer's, um, you know, habits for the most part, you know. I look for, I tend to look for open country. Um, for one, uh, you know, the mule deer, if we're hunting them early, uh, they're in the velvet and their, their antlers are a little tender and they like to stay out in the open in these big basins and stuff so they can, you know, not bump their antlers and, and uh, really feed on the high mountain vegetation that's open to sunlight. So um, another thing I'll look for is those high springs, those secluded springs that, you know, like for elk, they, they, they need a lot more water. So big key water sources, you know, um, creek drainages, that kind of thing, um, tend to keep the elk in that particular area. But high on the mountains where there's just a spring or something like that, um, that can really hold mule deer. Um, support mule deer and keep them away from the elk, you know, because 
most of the deer in our country, if there's a bunch of elk, you're not going to see a bunch of deer. So right, that's the same with here too. Yeah, same here. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, a, a in other states that I've hunted like, too, Montana. I think that's I think that's pretty common. Uh, <laughs> mainly, I think because even though mule deer are browsers and 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 uh, elk are are grazers, I think mule deer tend to uh, find most of their like the forbs and stuff they're eating in the same type of grass. Um, so they're in, almost in competition with each other. So um, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but. Oh, that's all right. I mean, I, you know, I don't really have a, a real recipe. That's basically what I'm getting at is, you know, I don't have some set guideline that I do, you know, throughout growing up, I kind of just, you know, I wanted it kind of thing. You know, I, I wanted to find a, a hunting spot that kind of, you know, especially for mule deer that I could find older age class bucks and be able to hunt mule deer and not run into pressure. So mm-hmm. like I said, a lot of it's just gut intuition of knowing, you know, I've drove by here and there's not very, there's not very many people or there's not very many houses or it's a long ways for people from the, you know, the suburbs, the city or whatever to, to drive and put a lot of pressure on these deer. Let's key in on those areas. And I hunt a lot with my buddy Rick and uh, we, every year we've got a checklist of places that we go check out. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are, you know, a swing and a miss and a lot of them are hitting the nail right on the head and we're, you know, kind of abandoning old spots that weren't nearly as good, but it's just a revolving, um, you know, it's a revolving list. Just like, you know, Chad going out there looking for new country. He's got all his spots that he's learned his whole life that he can go to those spots and he can, Cherry pick through those spots and see which bucks are good up and coming bucks. If not, it's time to right. move on and find new country. And just it's just an evolving game of spots. Basically, you got to have a backup plan after backup plan after backup plan, and that's right. That's that's where you got to love it. You've got to, you, you know, you just got to love it. So. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think that's part of the fun of it. I think he hit it right on the head with that one. I mean, it's just. You, I, I I was born and raised here. I've lived here my whole life. Uh, I've covered this whole desert from Phoenix to Tucson to Yarnell all the way to Yuma. Uh, yeah. And have even ventured into California. And it's just you gain knowledge over time. And you know what tends to hold deer or good bucks at times mm-hmm. and you just keep you keep that record in, in your head I, I write things down I I, I keep a, a running log from year to year what what weather patterns have happened in the desert you know we we don't get a lot of rain yeah so it might rain one or two times in a five mile area and then not rain for 15 to 20 miles across the desert, well, it just moved all your deer that were in one of your best spots over to this new area. And it may take five or six years for those deer to get back over there, but that's still going to be a good spot. Right. Because the minerals in the ground, the layout, it, the, you just keep going back to them and you just don't give up on them. Yep. No, I agree. Got anything you want to add, Marlon? The, <clears throat> I think that part of the reason why we're all such good buddies is the fact that we all kind of think alike. I mean, they, it's almost like you can do a podcast with one of us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, Chad and, Chad and Travis just, they dump the nail on the head with a lot of this stuff. It, look, I mean, if you notice common themes here, like let's break it down for what it is, right? And And John, I mean, Anybody that, you know, wouldn't say that you're as hardcore as either of us, they're crazy because you are. You love it just as much. You're just as passionate about it. Um, You know, you actually are one of the guys out there trying to provide value uh, to people and, you know, getting people like us out there and kind of trying to gain insight on how things go. So, I mean, there's there's no loss of love. I mean, we're not the heroes here and you're the unsung. I mean, you know, (laughs) just as well as I do. And Chad, Travis, the fact of the matter is, is that, Look, it's about being willing to do what others aren't. 
I mean, the gym and the protein and the freaking fitness, you know, I mean, that's all great and dandy, but there's giant bucks being killed with Twinkies and Snickers bars, okay? <laughs> yeah, I exactly. I mean, like, exactly. you, you, sh you should literally see uh, our backcountry. Our backcountry backpacks look like the freaking <laughs> convenience store aisle of a freaking gas station along the freaking main interstate. That's, like, the facts of it. You know, people want to uh, say, yeah. oh, I eat this and I do that and I work out. Yeah, I work out like a beast, but so does, you know, Chad and so does Travis and we get ready and we hike and at yeah, the end of the day it's like <laughs> not it, it really at the end of the day none of us drink none yeah. of us drink so boys you want to like step up your game and do something about it quit going to friends you know uh, sports parties quit drinking start yeah. focusing your effort on scouting quit you know doing things that are leisure activities and focus on the fact that you have a real goal in hunting and in order to achieve it you're going to have sacrifice and that doesn't mean that those things are bad it's just that there's always going to be compromise right when you decide to start a family and have kids guess what there's mm -hmm. a compromise you know with hunting it's the same thing the common theme here is just that compromise it's like you're willing to give whatever it takes to taste that success and that's why i candidly and firmly believe that five percent of the hunters take 95 percent of the game consistently year in and year out because they're the ones that are willing to just do whatever it takes and and that's yeah. kind of my two cents because i mean i do the same things they do and i mean even you know locally close to me three to five hours away whether it's arizona california or whatnot i'm, I'm scouting my tail off i'm every single week i'm out two or three days a week looking at something I, yeah. I provide myself with value so that that way come season i'm not just sitting there going well geez where do i go yeah, it's yeah, not a position I want to be in. Even if I can only kill a local buck that's a 160 inch deer, well, that's like a 220 inch buck somewhere else. I know, you know, it looks like a small buck, but they don't grow them big where I hunt, and and it's it's a feat to try and find something like that. And Chad knows, and Travis does too. I mean, we we bust our tails and we hunt over the counter tags and kill the biggest stuff we can find in our areas. Right. We had a couple of questions come in uh, that I want to address because I keep uh, the feed moves so fast I can't keep up with them. Uh, real quick, uh, we had somebody ask Chad if uh, you ever think you'll kill a bigger buck than the, the old desert hog, but uh, you know I I don't want to say uh, that I won't. The probability isn't there. Uh, I'm going to put the best effort I can into it. I, I'm looking for the typical class of that deer. Yeah. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I've I've got goals. Marlon knows what they are, uh, and I'm gonna be disappointed if if I don't get it done. Yeah. I've got uh, I've got goals, but uh, at the same at the same time, I'm not gonna turn down solid bugs. No. To uh, no. achieve those goals. No bird in the hand. Uh, we had a question from uh, Austin Atkinson who uh, asked about trail cameras. What, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this at Travis. Um, do you use trail cameras to uh, scout, and do you use them during the season? Um, you know, where I live, there's a lot of water, and mm -hmm. unless you got a lot of time and a lot of cameras, you're gonna do a lot better with your glass. So, where you know, a lot of my hunting's done here in in Idaho. There's just you know, it's really, you know, it's wasted time when I can put boots on the ground. So. Right. Um, we had a, we had a question from Josh Deards and you know what, Josh, buddy, I forgot what it was. <laughs> I'm trying to remember them because they're disappearing. Like I said, I can only see like five or six at a time. Um, so if you want to repost that, I'll definitely ask it. Uh, we just got a question from Chad. Um, what would you say the home range is for mule deer bucks in the Yuma area? Uh, any tips on trending these deer in and off the season? You know, I, I would say range is 10 to 15 miles uh, on, on average. Once, once a mature buck sets up residence, he normally stays there. However, uh, our weather is so severe down here that drought tends to move them. At times, uh, I did notice a, a vast area of our desert that was hit by drought but over the last couple of years. Uh, the majority of our deer moved over towards agriculture. And uh, I mean, we still had had some deer out there to hunt, but a lot moved over 
over to agriculture and you know it'll it'll take a few years to for them to move back but you know with years like this last one it'll happen and a lot of those deer travel you know 20 to 25 miles if that gives you any aspect on it yeah um i typically i personally and i know you like to use trail cameras you know I, that that's been a that's been a touchy topic lately uh trail cameras on the desert you know it they're helpful because it is a water mm-hmm. supply but uh the same token during by the time it's hunting season those deer are four to five miles at least from those water holes because they're man-made and they don't want to be there uh and, and for the guys that are that are against them whether you're for it or against it every time you take away somebody's rights or vote yes on something you take away somebody's rights whether you like it or not and there'll be a time when something rolls around on your guys' side that you're not going to like and you're just going to have to deal with it so we just need to keep in mind that every time we pass a regulation that then it ends up hurting us in the long run okay we got a couple other questions i'm going to move away from the uh from the trail camera discussion um Josh Deers asked, um, when did you realize that you were next level? And I'm not sure which one of you guys he was, uh, or which one of us, even if I was in that or not. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to say, go ahead. Uh, when did you realize, Chad, that you were next level? Am I next level? I think, you, I think you're next level. I, uh, I don't look at it that way. Uh, I think I can do better. Uh I've never looked at myself as as next level. I think there's, you know, I look up to guys like you. I look up to Travis, you know, Marlin, uh, and and try to push myself. Yeah. But I've never been one to think that I'm I'm better than anybody else or, you know, I've had a good run. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of a big deal, so, you know, um, (laughs) it's kidding. No, honestly, I'm, I like to think myself as, just like everybody else. I just, but I have a lot more time uh, in the field and I've been doing it for a long time. So I don't think I'm next level. I just think I, I spend a lot more time than most people do. You know, when you're spending at least a hundred days a year hunting, um, you know, you end up killing more stuff. It's like, it's like anything else, you know, it's like the lottery. You can't win if you don't play. So, and I, and I try to play as much as possible. So, um craig said when you shoot a big toad like that you're there so (laughs) you're there chad um matt howell asked if uh anybody had any tips for relocating those high uh high country mule deer after they've shed their velvet yeah we do it quite a bit um matt you know the country that uh that we're in quite 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 regularly um we hunted a, a big buck called uh, Freak Nasty. Um, he was uh, living above timber all of July and August, and then shedded his velvet and ended up hanging out um, literally just inside the timber. So the big misnomer is right that these bucks are super transient, that um, they move a lot. They really don't. They're homebodies. They're super couch potatoes. They're in lazy mode. They're wherever it's like easiest pickings and less pressure. And I got to be honest with you, like pressure, that's secondary. Um, Mm -hmm. Big bucks will deal with a lot of pressure. They'll be in some places where you sit there and look at and go, really? I thought you were old, mature, and had some wisdom about you. You know, they put themselves in some really, what I would think would be silly places. But um in all reality, they like to put themselves in places that are just easy, right? Easily accessible to escape routes, food, cover, water, all that kind of stuff. And I mean, I've seen 200 inch bucks, 190 inch bucks, just upper age class deer living in places where you'd totally not expect them. So high country, 12,000 feet above timber. Um, we've relocated lots of bucks within like a two square mile home range. That is their summer range. They're not going to leave it. So let's say, for instance, you locate your big trashy non-typical and you're like, oh my God, it's the buck of my dreams. 
Um, you got to like literally sit there and ask yourself, okay, what's my highest and best use? Does that make sense? So you got to ask yourself, if I find this buck, am I willing to spend my whole season chasing him or end up with tag suit? That, that's the ultimate question because he didn't leave. And that's the thing that's really important to, to take in. That buck didn't go anywhere. He's still there. Um, he's just in a different pattern now. So when he loses velvet, all he did was was basically change his his routines and what he's you know what he's gonna typically do. Um, but he'll shed velvet and just go into the timber. And generally speaking, it's no more than I would say a quarter of a mile to a third of a mile mm-hmm. from his original summer bed. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, it's right below his original summer bed. Like it, it'll be generally in the same basin. Uh, assuming, that, that, assuming all the uh, the feed and the water and all that other stuff stays there. The, it 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 all it's always there though. Yeah. It's the the feed and the water is always there. The feed and the water is not going to be the problem when they get out of velvet like that. It's going to be more weather induced. Like for instance, last year in the high country, we had a heck of a, heck of a time even finding a deer. I mean, mm-hmm. they were in, there was two feet of snow, 12,500 feet on opening day. Jeez. And every single buck that was, you know, in a position where we could hunt him prior to season was basically like way into the timber. They were betting, you know, a thousand feet below the timber line, but they didn't leave. It's just that you got to know, like, let's say you're an out of state, out of state hunter, like, you know, like I am for the high country. Uh, I can't invest a whole month trying to pursue one deer. I'll waste all my time there and I will end up with nothing. So I got to like think highest and best use. I have, even if it's a big buck, I got to kind of like be willing to move on mm-hmm. knowing that there's a big buck there. And if I spend my time hunting him, there's a chance I could get up to catch up to him. It's also a chance I might not. So for me, it's one of those things where I'm still in that wheelhouse where I like to put stuff on the ground as long as it's decent. I'm not a 200 or bust kind of person. I, I, you know, I just, if I see a 165 or 170, like I'm just, just as giddy and happy as I were if it was 200 inches. I mean, don't get me wrong. I haven't killed a 200 inch buck yet. Like Chad and Travis, they've both reached that mark. I haven't. Nor have I. Um, You know. (laughs) But I'm not gonna. I'm not the kind of guy either that's gonna pass up a a good solid um, 165, 170 uh, on day four. Like on day one, I'm never shooting that buck. But on day four, I'm not passing him up. That like I'll give it a little while, but they don't leave the summer range to answer Matt's question. I won't pass him up on day two. So. Day one, I'll give him the bus pass, but <laughs> uh, we had a couple other questions come in. Um, one from Ron Nixon. The other one was from Brandon Brooks. Actually, I think you were directing it to me. I'm not sure. It, you ha- he asked if, uh, is it true that you always approach a mid uh, ridge buck or a, you know, a buck that's hanging out halfway up on the mountain from above? And I, no, I, there's no rule. Of, I mean, there's rules of thumbs, you know, where certain things, but whatever the wind is doing is how you're approaching them. Whichever way they're facing is how you're picking your approach. I mean, um, I don't think coming from b- above or below, I mean, yeah, maybe above is a little bit easier at times, but it just given the terrain, um, you know, sometimes below is, is better. And, he, and it's something about mule deer that I've noticed, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like if you come from above them and they catch movement, they're going to explode out. But if you're coming from below them and they catch movement, they'll stand there and they'll give you that mule deer, look you know, back. look back or whatever, and they might hop off a little bit and then stop. And it kind of gives you an opportunity. Um, you know, to, to make a shot. Um, and, and I don't know, it seems to, I'm not a very sneaky person. So my shots are always fast and furious. That's why I practice running and shooting and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you guys got anything else to add to that, but I'll take that as a no. 
Um, the other question was from uh, from Ron Nixon and back on the trail cameras. He was asking, um, have you ever had a had a deer sit there and stare at a trail camera and then never show back up? No. No. I. No. No. Not, not unless that wasn't his normal grounds. Right. I've, I've never had that happen. Yeah. And, we're, and, we're, and honestly, if they didn't show back up, it's hard to say because how did you handle that trail camera? Is your stench all over it? You know, um, and the good thing about the desert, if was if it a he, fluke that you if, caught him once, if he did <laughs> you know, that water hole, he's at the next one. So somewhere close. That's kind of, you know, something that's interesting too, though. Like that, that, that answer is very highly dependent to your geographic region of hunt like you, you can't yeah. that's not that's not a blanket answer because areas where there's not a lot of water um those deer are relying on it they don't hit that same tank and and those tanks can be spaced you know uh 12 14 15 miles apart just depending on the tank those deer when it's 100 105 110 they don't go any more than three to four miles from water they are literally within that circumference so from their standpoint, they were born there. They, the mother gave birth to the fawn there. And they learn home range because they don't migrate, right? The does tend to follow precipitation around, but in the summertime, they're stuck to water. So they, they're raised and they learn these, these you know, areas because that's where they were born. Um, and they don't really deviate from that. Now, if you're a, hunting a high country buck and you have a high country buck, kind of that you see on a on a cam he might not show up especially if it's july or early august if it's july or early august and you have him on camera he could be 10 15 miles away depending on where his migration grounds are and where he was you know where he was born can change significantly can i my two cent. a quick moment yeah so on, on i just had something pop in my head i've set trail cameras up on actual trails going into the water, you know, back set them 50, 60 yards before the water itself. And yeah, they don't like them. They change their direction and they'll, they'll start a new trail. So do they like the camera? No. If they have to water there, they'll, they'll put up with it. Uh, but like Marlon's saying, if, if there's abundance of water and you put a camera out, more than likely you're going to change his habits a little bit. And that's with any camera. I haven't seen one that they haven't noticed. Okay. I don't know. I got a lot of trail camera footage of, of, of bucks. And, and I, when I use a trail camera, I don't use it in the desert very often. Um, I use it a lot up like in, uh, you know, the Ponderosas and stuff like that. And, or if I, back in the day when I used to set out salt licks and whatnot, um, I never really noticed that it affected them. I had them, I've had them come up and lick the damn camera before. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. It's just, I think it's one of those things. It's, <clears throat> it's possible. Yeah. Do you get a really skittish, you know, buck that doesn't tolerate anything? Yeah. He's going to notice it obviously, but is it enough to, to blow him out of there? I guess it just depends on the buck. So, uh, Chad, how many trail cameras do you run? David Rydell wants to know. You know, last year, I think I ran three for a few weeks. I did most of my work on the ground. Uh, this last couple weeks, I've had six different cameras out. I've already pulled them. Uh, it just depends on how much time I have. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for something special before they shed to try to keep better tabs on them. So but it's so green, I'm really not having any luck at water. So, uh, you know, I've had as many as ten out this last this last year. We didn't we didn't do much with cameras. Right. Uh, the year before we had what do we have? Ten, Marlon. At least, I think there was a couple that. Yeah, there's. Yeah, we had a lot out. Ten, twelve. <laughs> And then the year, before, the year before that, I didn't run. I think I had 
Ooh, one weekend's worth of pictures of that big buck. I pulled my camera in August. Uh, I basically had enough of taking pictures of him. Right. So uh, it just depends. Depends on the year. Yeah. We just got a good question from uh, Austin Atkinson. Uh, for a newbie archery mule deer hunter, which state would you, should they start with? Colorado, Idaho, Arizona, Utah. I I tend to think, and I, I've hunted all those states. I tend to think that Arizona for me, well, I guess it depends on the time of year because in the rut, not so much. But for early season hunt, I think is probably the hardest out of all them, unless you're willing to sit water and just sit water, you know, for seven days, knowing that you're not going to see a damn deer except for one and it'd be that one buck. Well, that and our, our numbers are, oh, yeah. aren't what other states are. I like Utah. I think Utah, hands out. I've been in Utah three times and I killed all three times. But I don't know. Colorado's good too, though. I don't know. They're all good. Well, I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, Utah's a good state. Let's just, just kind of keep them out of Idaho here. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, so I've hunted Idaho. Um, I've actually never killed a deer in Idaho, so maybe that's why it's not on my list. Um, but I, I, I think I, I think I like Utah because the numbers are high. And this is, we're talking about a newbie archery mule deer hunter. We're not talking about uh, trophy hunting. Uh, my, my answer probably would have changed had you said that, you know, it would have been a, tro like, you know, where, where could a guy get a bigger, because I would say Colorado for sure, because I don't know. I think number of big deer in Colorado or to me, I've seen more big deer there than I've seen. I mean, you see really big bucks in Arizona, but they're few, they're few and far between compared to Colorado. You know, I guess it all depends. Uh, I'm going to shut up. Let you guys talk. <laughs> what about hunting whitetail? I mean, that would be good for a newbie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, 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 Chad's trying to like uh, direct traffic here. <laughs> I, yeah, I, ne ne Nebraska's a great place, you know. Um, Florida, Florida, Texas Panhandle. <laughs> Actually, Florida's got oh, a shit ton of deer, man. <laughs> so oh, Texas is retarded. Texas is actually retarded, man. It's I, I don't have any of you guys actually hunted Texas because I have several times, and it's like yeah, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It's crazy. That would that would probably be the best place for a for a newbie archery hunter to go if you can afford to yeah, go. Yeah, but they're, they're talking about mule deer, a newbie yeah. archery mule deer hunter, and and uh, actually mule deer in Texas is very tough. I I would hunt probably. Northern AZ, something like that. Yeah, if, yeah. It, if it was me, I'd just I'd find a hunt that you can get every year. You know, a good over the counter hunt or something that you can uh, get a hunt and year after year you can kind of evolve yourself as a hunter. If you're a beginner, it's gonna it's gonna be better right. to stick to an area and and be able to learn as you go. Yeah. Travis gave, Travis gave the best advice there. That that's the honest yeah. question is go where you can get a lot of practice. Go where you can like really consistently draw a tag and and that's where you're going to see yourself get the most gains out of your mm -hmm. hunting endeavors that you're going to allow yourself to basically have hallowed ground. I talked about that in a few magazine articles and another podcast before where, you know, we got to kind of hunt off the scraps, so to speak, if we want to get good at something. Right. Because trying to put in for these draws, I mean – anymore with point creep and you start talking about um success and some of these limited draw uh units that we might get once every 10 years i mean five years if it's not such a good hunt 10 15 20 years i mean they're they're really almost like it's becoming the type of thing where it's like this significant bonus and it's this huge thing that you just drew a tag um, but it's still not even filled so this the expectation is is almost so much greater um, on you to like, you know, do the tag justice. Sometimes it becomes a little crazy. So I think that, um, you know, I'm the kind of guy that actually did what that question was, you know, the derivative of that question. I don't live in Mule Deer country. I have to drive 
five hours to even touch mule deer country mm-hmm. and there are, you know, at least four. Um, and so Arizona is great because it's, there's still over the counter hunts that are really decent that you can put your work in and still get a good buck. Unfortunately, Travis, you know, Idaho has good opportunity too, but the thing is, <laughs> it's not going to never going to affect Travis because, you know, he does his own research in places that an out of stater is just never going to go. Like they, right. they, you, you, he, he hunts country where you look at it, you, you know, same as the desert where we hunt, you look at it and go, there's no way anything lives here. Um, and, and so it, it's kind of like, you got to hunt those over the counter opportunity type hunts and just kind of build up some kills. Yeah, I agree. The, you, the more practice you get and the places that give you the most opportunities are typically the best places to, to start off as a newbie hunter. You know, even if there's a lot of people hunting there, cause I mean, I've hunted pressured deer my whole life. I, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not much of a backcountry hunter. So I, I learned how to hunt where other people are hunting. Um, just thinking outside the box. Um, we just got a good question, uh, in from Brandon, uh, Glenn tips on closing the gap, the last hundred yards. Uh, you know, Travis, I'll, I'll let you and your, uh, your sneaky feet over there take take over that question. <laughs> Free plug time. <laughs> well, I mean, in all seriousness, you know, when you get within 150 yards, it's time to slow down. And, um, you know, being quiet and keeping the wind in your face and just moving slow is probably one of the biggest – I don't, the biggest things that have helped me, you know, when I finally put it, figured it out, you know, when I was younger, I'd, I would find a buck and I'd always seem to blow him out, you know, if I, the stocks wouldn't work. And now I'm to the point where if I don't get in bow range, something's wrong. Like, you know, most every stock I've been in for the last, you know, five, six years, most of them I get in bow range. And it's because, I slow down, you know, mule deer pick up on movement for one, you know, if you, I mean, even if you're standing, you don't need to crawl. You don't need to just use the land in the way that it's um, best to get in on a buck and just go slow, move slow, um, get yourself a pair of, you know, rim rock stalkers or sneaky feet or a pair of wool socks. Just get something that's going to give you an edge to be quiet and, uh, you know, the confidence that you need to close the gap. So. Get rim rock stalkers. All right, now, now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sneak tech guy. <laughs> I was joking. Um, no, actually, there you do make some those are amazing snow uh, stalking boots. But um, no, I agree with you. I, I I think I remember talking with Marlon about it, uh, and and you said it best. If you think you're going slow, you're going too fast. Uh, and that's good advice. I've actually said that to myself several times since you told me that several years back. Uh, and it's actually helped me slow down a little bit because I am a go, 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 go person. Um, uh, and, <clears throat> and, I, and I kill things despite my stupidity. So um, I think I could be even more successful if I would just slow the hell down. Uh, we you got know, a question. Oh, go ahead. you want to say something? I was just going to kind of – add add to that john and that you know the the thing is is there's a time to be really aggressive okay Mm -hmm. and and get into the hunt and then there's you know a time to slow down and realistically i mean mule deer are very reliant on their senses with that being said uh, they're not super super focused simply on just one sense and if you're a student of their body language and you become a student of their behavior, and you understand what their ear positions uh, at, you understand how their eyes operate and what they're looking at, Um, and you understand whether they're chewing their cud. Believe it or not, there's little subtle things, like when they're chewing their cud, it sounds silly, but their head has vibration in it. And if you tune into that, you could stand up, and I don't recommend it, but if it's your only option, you can stand up and clear view of them. If you're, uh, especially if you're not silhouetted, you can stand up in clear view. Like you were saying, you know, being below them and approaching, 
uh, if they're bedded up and you're not silhouetted, you can take slow movements straight at them with their eyes gently closed, not not even, you know, sleeping, but chewing their cud, ears pinned back, face headed like at a 90 degree angle from you. I've stood straight up and, and taken steps uh, towards bucks and, you know, cut the distance from 120 yards down to like 70. As soon as you start... There's a weird barrier. There's a barrier at like 160 mm-hmm. to about to about 90. As soon as you get inside of like 80, it's almost like there's a, a room there that you can make a lot, not a lot of noise, but more noise than you can make at 150, believe it or not, because it's almost like in their comfort zone. It's almost like in their wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. You'll be crashing, not crashing through, but you'll be step, not like placing your knee or your hand on little little pebbles and and little rocks that kind of make like a little grinding gritty noise or a snapping of a little bush and it's almost okay because it's natural for their environment they're used to it and then the rhythm of their body language is more important to focus on with that that's that's really what you know i think if i'm going to give value to somebody right now key in and become a student of the deer and really understand what they're doing that's going to give you such a huge edge oh yeah um I mean, you know, and on top of, you know, knowing when to be aggressive and knowing when to go slow in general, you're right, though. If you think you're going slow enough, slow, uh, slow down some more. Yeah. yeah All right. You, we got. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, he, just listening to him, I mean, it just it lets you think a little bit. You know, you, you kind of just need to be in tune with the hunt. Like, yeah, you need to move slow. But just like Marlon said, keying in on what the animal is doing and adjusting to their behavior is everything that will pay dividends in the end. Mm-hmm. I think I think a, a lot of it is that not every situation is doable, and you need to know when you can go and when you can't go. Uh, this last January buck, I, I sat 120 yards over the top of him for four hours. Uh, things weren't right. I knew the sun was going to move him I, from where he was laying. I, I knew he was going to move his bed. It did. He moved down range and things slipped up a little bit. He gave me an open window and it worked out. I was willing to leave. I, I, I was willing to leave him there and, and and try him again at a better time. It's. I, I would recommend, I mean, in this just goes to, going and hunting and practicing and spending time in the field is I put stocks on a lot of animals and it's not hunting season. Yep. Uh, like Marlon said, you know, learning the animal, getting, getting some knowledge on, on behavior and, and what they like, what they don't like. Yep. That, that helps a ton. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I actually wrote that in my book years ago. Um, that I one of the things I did for a long time is I'd practice just going stalking animals, um, you know, without my bow or whatever, you know, and then I even I even added my gear too because you know wearing a pack or whatever changes things up. Hell, I put stalks on my dog all the damn time just to see if I could sneak up on them. Um, yeah, do I, you know, start hunting coyote in the off season and try to try to glass them up and put stalks on coyote. I, you you get a coyote and spot and stalk, you can get a deer, for sure. <laughs> so um, anyway, we got three questions that came across that I want to address here before we we get off this call. Um, two of them I'm going to take real quick. Um, Brandon Brooks asked, "Do you guys use a decoy during the rut?" Um, I don't. I don't. No. Uh, I do for whitetail if I'm sitting in a tree stand. But not for not for spot and stalk. I think it's too uh, cumbersome and and whatnot. What about you, Travis? I think it could you know it could be effective and it could have its place. But you know that's just one more thing I got to carry in my backpack. So yeah, that's uh, that's my thought process. Anything I could leave out of the backpack, I'm I'm good with. Uh, uh, John Breitzman uh, just asked asked if in the low country, when do you start? scouting for the second season i'm assuming he's talking he's a for arizona boy um i'm assuming he's talking about hunting the rut here and my answer is I never stop scouting for, for if you're hunting the rut i'm always looking for where the does are at 
because where the does are at, that's where the boys are going to come show up eventually. So there's a little trick to that, and there's another question on here that uh, yeah. has, yeah. has to do with, with deer in the flats, and most of my pictures seem like they're in the flats. Most of my pictures seem like they're in the flats because I don't want to take pictures of ridge lines. Yep. Uh, a lot of your big bucks like to hide out. They like to get in little crevices and be reclusive. Uh, when you find those areas, they don't just show up during the rut. They're there the whole time. They're just hiding. Yeah. And a lot of times, guys will be seeing a lot of deer during the beginning of the rut, and there's deer everywhere. And the next weekend, I'll get a message, hey, where – Where'd all my deer go? Do you, do you, do you know where my deer might have went? And uh, they're back in the crevices. You know, they they quit being in the flats. The big bucks got them, and and they're they're tucked back home where they want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you sure there there are deer out in the flats too? Uh, some of those some of those bucks are. Kind of impossible, uh, just because they they set themselves up to be able to see forever. Uh, there'll be one Palo Verde in the middle of a Malapai and nothing else around it for a mile, and there'll be big buck land under it. You're not closing the deal on him. <laughs> You'll fly over him and see him, but that's about all you're going to do. Um, okay, so you I guess you kind of already addressed what Anthony was asking. That in a nutshell. Um I think um I think a lot of that has to do with where you're hunting though too. Cause I feel like up down there in Yuma, yeah, totally. Totally can see that. But up here where it's you know, a lot more roll. It, I mean, our flats aren't really flats like flats like they are down there. With I mean, those are freaking yeah. Bonneville, yeah. Bonneville flats down there. You know, so um, you know, it, I think over here, like up like in a Phoenix area, or even north of here, or, or even Tucson, um, I think it's a different story. I, I I I think a good rule of thumb is keep tabs on the does. Um, if you're just planning on hunting the rut and bucks are going to be showing up and then let your eyes do the work. I think that's the easiest thing for a guy to add into his tool bag. Cause if you're going to be like this guy, uh, you know, you gotta be a freaking mathematician and a statistician and, and a, a scientist to figure out what these bucks are doing all the time. It's, it's going to be a lot harder on you and you need to spend the time. So, well, one thing to keep in, in, you know, mind here is be mindful that um, does tend to have a particular area that they stay and they live and they'll die. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to move as much as a lot of people might think. They, you know, have a home just like you or I, and they're not going anywhere. So um, be mindful of the fact that if you just find you know, during the rut, I'm speaking to, uh, even before the rut, you find your doe groups. If you can, they're going to be close to water and feed because they're most often going to have yearlings. If it's an area that has, you know, two or three, four or five does, whatever, uh, the desert's fiercely competitive and Chad can, you know, attest to this probably more than I can, but I will say just from my experience over the last decade, the does are going to be very much so centered around feed and water especially for the youngsters, right? The yearlings and the newborns. So um, if you just don't even pay attention to looking for bucks, like forget about where the bucks are. Forget about what the bucks are doing. Forget about anything having to do with anything with horns on its head. If you're hunting a rut, just focus on, you know, where the ladies are at, right? Yeah. You do that, you're going to be just fine. If you find the doe groups, then all you need to do is put in your head, you know, on your little map in your head where these doe groups are and just alternate you know as the rut closes in like start 
getting up on high spots above your dough groups and make just do a circuit like every day do a different circuit check your does out and eventually uh, if you have a good rut, rut hunt tag where you know you're gonna hit the peak of the rut in that group of does and you know that there's big bucks in the area he's gonna be on them uh, unless it's super super hot or mm. it's a full moon then they're gonna do it at night but in general like you can have a ton of success just finding does yeah no i, I couldn't agree more I, I, I unless you're trying to hunt a specific buck then it's a completely different story well, we got two other questions that i want to hit before we get off this call uh bill babish who's a muley killing fool and basically kills a buck every year in arizona um his question is when guys bust out bucks and chase them into the next country uh, a lot of times, if you stay put, that buck will come back. Do you guys have that same experience? I, I'd say, yeah, I've I've seen it many many times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you obviously try not to. Uh, it just depends. I think it depends on how hard, hard the rut. Bust, <laughs> or, or yeah, how hard you bust them at, or how how hard the rut's going too. Like you yeah. know, sometimes they'll freaking throw caution to the wind because they're so just hell bent on getting that. I guess unless the does went with them too, that's another thing, you know, but yeah, no, I agree with you, Bill. I've definitely seen that. I've seen it with you. Shit. You know? Um, so I think if you bust them during the rut, they're, they're, they're coming back. If you bust them during a normal, uh, rifle season or something like that, uh, they'll, they'll cover some miles that I watched a buck while well, I watched three bucks run, I don't know. We we watched a guy make a stock on on some deer and blow them out. And I was looking through the coas, and they were literally half a mile down in front of me. And I watched them run clear out of sight on flat ground. So yeah, those deer probably weren't coming back. Probably not. They're not. They go that far <laughs> for sure. Uh, last question. Um, John rushed asked. Let's see. Water, do you think about black tail bass, black tail deer hunting in Northern California? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. Actually, I thought I understood what the question was, but I guess it's do you hunt on water in black tail country in Northern California? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna throw that to you, Marlon, because I don't know other than myself. I'd hunt black tail, but Marlon would probably kill me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, black tail. Um... You know, blacktail are a very reclusive, uh, very reclusive animal. There's a, a ton of people that um, hunt blacktail on water. Uh, something to be cognizant of with hunting blacktail on water is if you're going to do it, <clears throat> uh, make sure it's like natural water um, or private property. You have to have access to private property. If you have access to private property, your you know your chances of being undisturbed on like a cattle guzzler or something like that is pretty good if you're not hunting private property and you're trying to hunt water on blacktails you're kind of wasting your time uh, because those bucks will pretty much all go nocturnal i've seen it happen over and over again i'll set up a camera on something that's accessible to even hikers um come uh, right around when they shed velvet a lot of those ones shed velvet in like August and on the coastal, the mid coast here, they'll shed velvet in like end of July. Um, those bucks will go nocturnal immediately mm -hmm. unless it's natural water. If it's natural water, you have to hike back into a steep Canyon and <clears throat> it's super, super solitary. And you know that nobody else is back there. You'll have a chance to, to catch that buck in the morning or the evening for sure. Yeah. Um, but it, again, it has to do with blacktail and pressure are hand in hand. Like if there's any pressure, you can count on it being in the dirtiest, darkest, nastiest little hole. I mean, it can be blackberry briars, six, seven feet around. They'll figure out a way to tunnel in to that stuff behind it in little tiny pathways that, you know, you or I couldn't fit down you know, crawling hands and knees with a bow, but yeah, you'll get a mature buck to get through it somehow. So yep. that's how, that's how uh, critical it is to hunt undisturbed natural water sources. If you want to try and kill one 
uh, on water. Or it's like I said, private property. Because the whole key here with the with the black tail is pressure. That's pressure. Yep. Yeah. They're they act a lot like white tail. Um, well, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up. We've been uh, kind of went over the hour here. Um, I'm sure we can. We got questions still coming through and stuff like that. But uh, I'll save those questions for the next time or for when I have you guys on individually, um, and uh, we'll address those then. I want to thank everybody for taking the time and uh, tuning into this podcast. Uh, There's a very uh, good group of guys asking questions and stuff out there. So thank you guys. And uh, Travis, thanks for coming on and Marlon and, you know, uh, one more thing, uh, guys, help me keep this podcast free. If uh, you subscribe and leave a review it helps me with my ratings and helps me keep my sponsors uh paying for this podcast so i can give it i can give you this awesome information for free so interviews with the hunting masters on podbean uh you catch us on itunes google play pretty much anywhere you can find podcasts uh we are in all those directories so uh thank you again and uh, don't forget, we're giving away a Matthews uh, Halon 32 to one of those fans um, in the beginning of June. Thanks a lot. Hey, John, thank you for making uh, you know this available to everybody and, and for having us on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for the invite. This thing could have definitely uh, just kept going. Yeah, yeah, no. I'm sure we could sit here and talk all night about mule deer. So... We all, we all love them to death. So literally to death. So, uh, <laughs> all right, guys, take it easy.